Okay. So good morning to you both. Thank you for coming here today. Good morning to you, Rachel. Lovely to see you. Good morning. Lovely to see you both too. So this is Edward Marston and Judith Cutler. And I've brought you both here today to ask you some questions to help new and aspiring writers in particular. So I'm just going to do a brief introduction of you both. So Edward Marston is a well-known British author particularly celebrated for his historical mystery and crime novels. He has written prolifically with his most notable works, including the Railway Detective series and the Doomsday series. Marston's books are known for their vivid historical settings and intricate plots, blending factual history with engaging storytelling. He has also written under various pseudonyms, including Keith Miles, reflecting his versatility and broad appeal in the literary world. He has written over a hundred novels so far, including nonfiction, and he used to write um, for The Archers on BBC Radio 4. And for those who don't know, The Archers is known for its depiction of rural life and its compelling storylines reaching a broad audience since its inception in 1951. So this shows how um, his ability to craft engaging narratives in various formats, adding depth and creativity to the programme. His next release is Mystery at the Station Hotel. And when is that due? What month is that out? That's an autumn release. Okay. Rachel, I'm just going to move the computer slightly. So you've got mostly me and not much Edward. So that means. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and my daughter has just done her work experience in our local bookshop in Wallingford Bookshop. She was over the moon when your books were up on the top shelf. And the lady said, Oh, yeah, do you know? We don't know much about him actually, but his books fly off all the time. We're always renewing them. So it was really nice. And then my daughter was so proud. She went, I know him. <laughs> so it was like really sweet. Uh, we just didn't expect it in our tiny little village bookshop, really. So further um, books by Edward Marston is the Railway Detective series, the Doomsday series, the, Eliz the Elizabethan Theatre series under Keith Miles, um, the Bell Street Rival series, the Homefront Detective series, and the Christopher Redmayne series. So this is Edward Marston, and he is an amazing writer. Now over to Judith Cutler. So Judith was my A-level English teacher at Birmingham many years ago and has been incredibly patient, guiding and feeding back on my desire to write while still working on her strict deadlines herself. Um, I'll be forever grateful of that. Without Judith... <clears throat> oh, I got emotional real quick then, sorry. <laughs> Without Judith in my life, I don't think I'd have ever had the courage to be a writer myself especially because of um, your extraordinary English and writing skills. Sorry, give me one second. I compose myself. Oh. <laughs> I just think of the audience. Rachel got a grade A in English, so let's just hook it up to our chest. <laughs> it was my only grade A because I, it was the best teacher I ever had to push me to an A. <laughs> I did get distinctions after that confidence boost, though, in the future. Um, so Judith's extraordinary English and writing skills, I was always a little bit intimidated by them, to be fair. So it made me a little bit nervous about writing. Judith had her first short story published 60 years ago and her most recent last week. Her 50th novel comes out in January and it's called At the Death. Other well-known works from Judith is Sof the Sophie River series, the Kate Power series, Lena Townend series, and her historical series, series uh, Regis Regency Clergyman T Tobias Campion. Um, her current series with a Victorian housekeeper and agent featuring Harriet and Matthew Rowsley. Judith has also written several standalone novels, often featuring strong female protog protagonists and involving deeply woven mysteries, always rich in character development and suspense. What I like about Judith's writing style is it's detailed and atmospheric. Um, she's known for creating vivid and well-detailed settings, which immerse the reader in the world of her characters. Her stories often focus on complex, well-developed characters, providing deep psychological insights. Um, a significant portion of her work revolves around crime, mystery and investigations, often featuring strong, intelligent protagonists such as amateur sleuths or police officers. Her background in education lends authenticity to her academic settings and her meticulous research ensures accuracy in her depiction of crime and investigation. Are you talking about me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hoping that that summarises you both as best as I can. Um, 
I think you're both legendary writers and you've been inspirational to so many people already in different ways. I'm just going to open the door because my cat is causing a noise as she tries to get in and out. Um, so I have a new Bengal kitten who's a little bit problematic. So is there anything either of you would like to say before I start charging into the questions? I'd like to start by saying to all of your people you're going to communicate with, use your public library. Absolutely. Because they are terribly under threat at the moment. Birmingham is axing loads of them. And this is going around countrywide. Now, I, and I don't think my husband, Ed, would, would ever have been writers mm -hmm. if it hadn't been for public libraries. Mm -hmm. um, when I was a child, I was very ill. I didn't go to school. And the public library was my university at the age of seven, eight, nine, ten. That we had a wonderful librarian who made us borrow a non-fiction book every time we had a fiction book. So she educated brilliantly. I think you have the same, Edward. Yes, absolutely. I belong to three different libraries in the same city. I used to go from one to the other so I could get three books out. Um, and I was introduced to it by a young lad who came to my school when I was, I think, nine or ten years old, and uh, his father was running the local um, Salvation Army uh, place. And the first thing he said to me was, where's the nearest library? I said, oh, it's the end of Clifton Street. He said, will you take me there? I said, yeah, sure. And I went with him, and that was a turning point in my life. All these wonderful books that you were able to borrow. And this is being denied to people now. Yeah. Not everybody can afford to buy things online. Not everybody can afford to buy things full stop. And the library is like a food bank for the soul. We need to campaign. We need to keep those libraries open. They're precious, precious places. I totally agree. Really good, valid points. Thank you, both of you. I, I've always tried to campaign for not people not buying my books on Amazon, but trying to go through bookshops and order them in at libraries. So anytime people say I can't afford to buy any more books, I order it in at your library then. It really helps writers because oh. then more people get exposed to your book rather than just the one reader who buys that book and reads it. So absolutely brilliant points. So we must support our libraries better. And I, I also thrived in libraries as a young girl. You know, it, it totally changed the shape of my life because I had that lovely, atmospheric, safe place to go to. I really, libraries are so special. They've closed a lot of them down in our area too and limited the opening hours. And they have little library buses that go around that very few children can access because they come in um, school hours, not outside of school hours. So anyway, to our questions. So. I love your feedback on so many different things. I'm going to try and keep this short so that I don't take up a whole day of questioning on you. So I've tried to consolidate what I think most people would really benefit from knowing from you. So the first question is, what was the most unexpected challenge you encountered whilst writing a book? Well, I suppose it was when I wrote my first book, which was not something of my own invention. It was based on the archers. I spent five years writing the archers and at that time, I was living on a dairy farm, which was wonderful. Every time I opened the door, I had a story. Um, I could see the, the year unfolding there and related to the, the, the program itself. And then for the 25th anniversary, which is when I was writing it, um, they decided to produce two books, uh, one of which I was asked to write. And that was completely uh, different for me. I made a living until then writing drama on radio, on television, and on the stage. And suddenly I had to go into this new idea of having total control over what was there. And it was wonderful. Uh, clearly, I was using characters in the arches over a period of years. Um, so to some extent, decisions that were made for me by that stage. But it was just a wonderful experience to realise that what I was writing was going to be sold as a unit. And I didn't have to have a large number of actors rehearsing it for six weeks beforehand. Uh, and then maybe one of those ill or all sorts of things take place if, if, you, if you're dealing with actors on a break. Oh, so great. Was, yeah. mine, was quite, mine was quite different because, as you alluded to in the introduction, my, I had my first writing success when I was 18. And I thought, this is easy. And in fact, 
I was approached by an agent when I was still 18 to say, you've got to write. And then I got a majestic case of writer's block at university because you're studying all these great writers and you know that you're not one. But then something happened. I started writing short stories again. And then I thought, I'll do a novel. I couldn't think of a thing to write about. But then the weirdest thing happened because I alluded to the fact I was a child. When I was very, when I was a child, I was very ill. I got chicken pox in my 30s. And when you have chicken pox in your 30s, it's bad. Mm. So I lay in bed a lot like I'd lay in bed as a child. And suddenly, and this happens to me, I get got the whole plot of a novel at once. Just like that. So I wrote it, sent it to my agent. He said, dear Judith, I'd love to see your typewriter again. What's happened to your talent? So I thought, oh, oh. And fired off a short story to the BBC. And this wonderful woman in Manchester said, yes, Judith, never heard of you, but I'm putting your short story on the radio. Then I did a cascade of short stories, got published in lots of places. And then I thought, well, let's try a novel again. And then I realised the next novel wasn't as good as it should be. And then the third. And that's what being a writer is for me, is that I would never start to run a marathon. I wouldn't do a marathon at I age anyway. But fairy steps. You start with something that's small. And writing short stories, you do so many skills for tightening, like writing scripts. Mm -hmm. Because you've only got a certain number of words. You can't think blah, 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 blah. You've got to think just the right word. So if you're a beginning writer, don't think about writing War and Peace tomorrow. Do a short story. Seriously. Mm -hmm. Then I did get published, and I had one major problem getting published, as I wrote about Birmingham. My dear, nobody wrote about Birmingham in those days. London. And my, I, my editor wanted to move it to London. No, I said it's Birmingham. Anyway, mm -hmm. Q, 16 novels about Birmingham. I was the only Birmingham writer at that stage. Oh, great. And, glad, and it's nice. I didn't know, actually, that your um, editor at the time had tried to get you to change it from Birmingham. So good for you for sticking to your guns on that. That's my lovely Birmingham. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's where we met. I love it, too. Um, can I ask you the next question, then? Can you share a moment from your personal life that inspired a scene or character in your books? somewhere yes when i was a student at oxford i had very long holidays in the summer so the first thing i did was to sign on at the seal works um, and i'd go into the labor pool and all sorts of things would happen and the first year i was uh, with a group of uh, people whose job was to um oil things in the, the strip mills which meant climbing up a a straight ladder, and then, because I was the, the new person, I was the one with the heavy bag, of course, and then we we oiled them, did this thing, and while I was up there in the strip mill, I could see these strips coming out red hot, and then one of these things was out of control and actually attacked, went through the the body of the, of the man who was, was there, and he was in absolute agony. I mean, he did survive, but the lower half of his body was paralyzed for the rest of his life. And he lived around the corner from me. And I remembered that incident. And I thought, I wonder if I could use that in a novel somehow. And I was invited to write a novel about snooker, a game which I played, played for many years. We had a half-sized snooker table in our house. Uh, the scouts had, where we went had a snooker table. We were playing it. And then suddenly a series called Pot Black was on television. So it was a, uh, a sport was there. And then by a fluke, I had uh, a play that was on tour, um, and one of the characters in the play said to me, oh, are you interested in snooker? I said, yes, uh, we were in Chesterfield at the time. He said, oh, my sister uh, works for the tobacco company that sponsors it. If you want to go, yep, if you want to see the world championship, you can go. Well, it was wonderful. It meant I could go in as, as a journalist and talk to the players, and that developed the idea which I had about somebody whose life had a complete break. The novel was called Breaks in Snooker. Of course, you have a break, which is to see how many points you can score. But this was a break which destroyed 
the main character, a young man about to go to university, and suddenly his father has this awful accident and he has to survive some other way. So forget university. And he tries to make a living as a professional uh, snooker player. So that was an interesting thing about something which was so dramatic. I thought I had to use it one day and I did. And which which exact book was the title of that book? The book was called Breaks. Breaks, okay. B-R-E-K-S. I think I've got that on my bookshelf, so I'm going to get that out with Tom and read yeah. it and tell him about this later. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. That's, that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And Judith? I think living in Birmingham was a big experience, a ginormous experience. But I'm going to offer you something quite completely different from that. Um, one of the things you do as a writer is capture an idea when it comes floating by. And one day, I've done my Birmingham novels and people say, well, we ought to do something else. Not much happens in the Kent countries, does it? Anyway, what happened is that I got an idea to write a series with an antique stealer, and it started. Then we moved here, and one day we were going out to lunch. It was a reunion, in fact, of Archer's writers, and I was going along as a decorative mother. And I was togged out in my best, and Edward was togged out in his, it was going to be a posh lunch. And we set out, we were driving on the local main road, and somebody said, I said, Stop, there's a body there in that field. And Edward said, yeah, 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 drove, drove. I said, no, 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 there's a body in that field. It became a very repetitive conversation. One of us saying no, and one of us saying there is. Eventually, poor Edward had to stop in the local gateway and turn around and come. And we still couldn't, he still couldn't see the body. Eventually, we retraced our steps entirely to the house and started up again. And there, we both saw the body in the field. 200 yards from the road, at least. Found a lay-by, stopped. Should we go and rescue this guy? Well, pretty dressed for me, posh suit for him. Barbed wire fence, horsehorns, brambles, 999. And so the police came and did a wonderful police job. Kicked the young person in question and told him he was drunk out of his mind because it had been the May Ball of the local college. And I thought, what happened if it were a real body and it disappeared? And I'd already started this story about a couple of antique dealers and it slotted in there. Nice. So, but, so, yeah, you know, you just grab at things. And I'm glad the young man wasn't hurt. I bet he, bet he had a monumental health hangover. You mentioned that the person who died jumped over the fence was a police woman. And she walked over to the body, just gave it a little kick. <laughs> she was lucky he didn't spew all over her feet, actually. But that's another story, isn't it? <laughs> that's another one, yeah, absolutely. And probably one that would get more young kids reading your books because I've noticed they all want gory, gross things like puking on feet would be ideal. <laughs> this is actually something I don't do. I don't do anything that could encourage, and neither do you, Edwin, that would encourage perverted behaviour of other people. Yeah. Less nasty people in this world. I don't do evis eviscerations. I don't do torture. I did do a fairly graphic piece on domestic abuse at one point. But I don't do the physical violence. Mm -hmm. I do it as it comes and as it's necessary, but I don't indulge because I don't want to indulge people's unpleasant ideas. We all have unpleasant ideas, but I don't want to legitimise them by putting them in print. Yeah, I, I have to find where my line is for that because I have a lot of martial arts in mine. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I try to follow a code of conduct with that myself. And uh, when I get more gruesome, it's normally using animals like the anacondas eating the aliens, and then it's kind of not realistic. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I try hard to do that. But I know where you're coming from. So long as you train your your pet anaconda not to do that. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I think more people should have those morals and they're not because they're trying to use shock tactics in books and not make children aware of it. I know my two have picked up books and went, wow, 
that is awful. That's not what I was expecting at all. They should give you a trigger warning or a heads up for something like that. So, no, I, I love your morals. Um, OK, next question. Have you ever considered self-publishing and why have you never gone down that route? Well, never had, luckily, I, I've never had to. I've always had an agent who was able to sell my work and suggest things that I should write. If you have a good agent, then you, you grow together, as it were. Uh, they're always trying to extend you in, in various directions instead of having the same thing time and time again. And I've been very lucky with the agents I've had. Well, I've had one, apart from the man who recognised my typewriter and one who read my talent was, he employed a young woman straight out of university. She was landed with me. She got me published. Um, we're, still, we're still close friends and she's still handling my stuff. There's only one area I was thinking of self-publishing because nobody knows where to place it. I, I write as a hedgehog, a hedgehog highways. I've got a huge fan following, perhaps not amongst hedgehogs, but among hedgehog lovers. So I'm thinking about that. But at the moment, it just seems, I'll just stay with what I've got and what's happening. But I carry on writing for hedgehog highways. And we had a complete stranger drop off a present for me the other day because they liked my hedgehog. Your hedgehog um, stories are brilliant. My husband had a weird experience. He was in the local doctor having a blood test, and the blood test person said to him, Do you realize who's out there? I've just dealt with this woman. She's the one that wrote, writes uh, Hedgehog Highways. It's amazing. She just walked in, and I, I follow this every single day. It's amazing. You want to go out and see her? I said, well, no, we've lived together. <laughs> <laughs> We're married. <laughs> I yeah. think your hedgehog highways could be really big. Uh, if you ever need any help with that, I will help you self-publish it. And um, I'm just learning loads of marketing ads, how to use the ads on YouTube and other social media platforms. And I think that's the way for you to market it then, because that will go out to all animal lovers, anyone on hedgehog Facebook groups and things like that. That's where you'd target the audience. Right. There are it? lovely stories, yeah. And for non-hedgehog fans, you know, your stories are brilliant. I got um, Olivia to read one, uh, oh. I think, the last time I saw one. We have a, a random animal in the garden. We don't like it. We'll leave it where it is. What is it? We, we, a, well, a white cat. We had a fox started to eat the hedgehog food. Mm. And I didn't want it a metre from the house, to be honest with you. Young fox, very hungry. Managed to get into all sorts of contortions to get out of the hedgehog. Feed, feedery and then one day it stopped and we couldn't think why we didn't want it in the garden but certainly we didn't want to find it dead on the main road just opposite the house so we like animals in the garden so and one was killed this morning we have a resident sparrow hawk there was a loud thud at the window and another death occurred Maybe I should write as a sparrow. You never know. You should, you should. And, you know, I've never forgotten that frog chase uh, being chased by your oh. snake. Yeah. We've never forgotten that. May I just clarify? It wasn't my pet snake. It's, it's your family that has pet snakes. It was <laughs> a random uh, grass snake that really wanted to eat a frog from our ornamental pond. And I'll leave Rachel to tell the story. It was a death run, wasn't it? It was It was absolutely the best reality TV I've ever seen. And it was just the way that the frog dived out of the pond. The snake went really dramatically full on after it. The sheer physical power of both of them was something to watch, wasn't it? Yeah. And we were all kind of rooted that the frog didn't get it. But we also <laughs> wanted the snake to eat. It was very yeah. emotional. And we don't know the ending because the frog went all the way around your garden, then back in the pond, and the snake followed it. So we never know what actually happened. Yeah. But then later on that evening, I saw the frog emerging, looking round, hopefully, as frogs do. No, and it just hopped on its happy way. So there is a happy ending. I so there was it. a Oh, lovely. Oh, that's nice today. <laughs> yeah, that was incredible to watch. Um, okay, what advice would you give to new authors wondering how to get their book published and how to get noticed by agents and publishers? Well, the advice that everybody gives is write what you know so that you can see it an instant this person is drawing on personal experience. Be authentic. Absolutely. Yeah. In practical terms, 
go back to basics. Um, what I was saying earlier, write short stories. There must be short story competitions out there. In my day, there were lots of women's magazines handling short stories, and I think they've gone now, alas. But find short stories, write to, it gives you a deadline, it gives you a challenge on the number of words you're allowed to use. It gives you perhaps an idea for a short story, you write on the theme of, do it, do it professionally. You won't win, but do it again. You do it again and you keep on doing it again. And you get a commendation, you get published. Now, I was incredibly lucky that way because my first ever short story won a prize. And you just keep on building up. And you may never publish a volume of short stories. I never have. But the fact is that all those skills, the right word, the pace, how long should your sentence be? How long should your paragraph be? Words, what words should you choose? All of those working with, with challenges will prepare you for writing a novel. And the other thing is to get a writer's group together. A group of people must much the same level same keenness, same drive. You don't want people to go along and say, oh, yes, that's nice. You want somebody to say, as one of my fellow creative writing groups said to me, do you think you may have published two novels, but you can't use this as an opening chapter? You want that sort of kind honesty from people. And criticism, you have to learn to accept criticism. No, you can't say that. That's an awful word there. Yeah. You have to, and to dish it out as well. But you have to dish it out kindly, always supportively. Mm -hmm. I think my rule of thumb for any writer is somebody will say, that's the wrong word. Why didn't you use this word? It's 99 times out of 100, they give you the wrong word. Mm -hmm. But the very fact they've said something needs changing mm -hmm. should say to you, something needs changing. Not what, the way they do it. It might be the previous paragraph that's led up to the wrong thing. But accept criticism. Act on the fact that it's an appreciation of criticism. Don't take it personally, but just think, could I possibly do something that would stop anybody criticising that paragraph? And you've got to be as firm and meticulous as if as if your life, your writing life does depend on it. So be meticulous. I know Absolutely. Edward and I will read each other's manuscripts before they go off. And he will go and... You can't use that word then, Judith, because mm. that word wasn't used, it wasn't in existence then. Mm. We're both meticulous about looking things up on dear old Dr. Google. Mm. When was the first use of this mm. word? And you have to be that meticulous. It's being professional. But if you write what you know, it makes it immediately clear to the reader that you've done your homework. Mm. I write about crime because I grew up in a a high crime neighbourhood in, in Cardiff. Um, my next door neighbour was in and out of prison all the time. Um, a friend of mine at school was involved in a, a mur the murder of his father. Um, all sorts of things happened. Uh, I worked in a prison in Birmingham teaching drama. Where at the same time during that period, I was playing for a rugby team in Birmingham, which consisted 50% of policemen. So I got both sides of the stories of people who committed the crimes and the one who try to solve it um, and continually we, we we have spotted over the years a number of people who we would describe as criminals who are operating in, in broad daylight in all sorts of schemes and things. I would like to see a novel in which scammers were speared mm. and hung, cut, hung, drawn and quartered, quartered and Oh, I'd be really, really nasty to scammers. I'm, is there a novel out there about revenge of someone on a scammer? You could do that one. Yeah, it would be a good idea. Um, just try to discourage it. There's so many at the moment, isn't there? It's really awful. And and they also don't seem to have any moral conduct, like there's anything wrong with it. They don't consider that they're thieves or destroying people's lives. Yeah. I think when it's online, it's like road rage. They just think they can do it because it's not really personal or anything. But yeah. I also like, um, you know, Bewitched, where Samantha wiggles her nose and she might yeah. love, love to do that on scammers. <laughs> Just wiggle your nose and, yeah. have them, you know, not be able to scam anyone again somehow. Um, are there any characters in your books that you relate to on a personal level? Well, my character, Sophie Rivers, the very first one, was a college lecturer teaching in a high-rise 
building um, in a mixed race society with a very, no, she didn't have a corrupt college management. She had a good college management. But a lot of, a lot of Sophie and, I, and me are connected a lot. Not all of us. I can't sing and she could. Okay. So, Sophie, actually, to be honest, I think every writer puts a lot of themselves into many of their characters. Mm. Because at least, this is another point. Unless you actually inhabit the character, have you ever considered how it must have been for a Victorian woman to play cricket where it was corset? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And how irritating it must have been for some Victorian men to wear lamb chop whiskers. <laughs> now, you, you've got to get, you've really got to dig in. Like Edward's character, who was injured and isn't, was in a wheelchair, you've got to get in there and empathize. And, I think that's one of those really good women writers. Sorry about that. There's women who emphasize as well. Yeah. And men. I did have a terrible speaking engagement with two very famous, very well published, best selling American writers. And for some reason, they dropped me on the panel. And the woman who was chairing the panel was obviously great fan of these two huge, huge American bestsellers. And they were boasting about the body count and what happened here and what happened there. And she said, of course, Judith just writes coses. At this point, I, I might have borrowed Edward's Welsh dragon because I wanted to. <laughs> um, I just asked the audience, you know, how many of you have been killed by a serial killer? How many of you have had your lives damaged by petty crime and other stuff. It was nice. It would have been very nice because I got a huge response. Sadly, when it came to signing the books at the end, and it was possibly the worst moment of my life, there was a huge queue, queue for A on the left, and a huge queue for B on my right, and a big round zero for me. Oh. But you, know, you, you have to ride with it. I turned up at a bookshop to do a signing one, so they hadn't got any of my books unpacked. That was good. But that's what you live with. Do we get the names of who those other writers were? No, no we don't. We don't. We don't. Okay. They, were, they were quite charming to me and embarrassed yeah. me by the sycophancy of the person sharing them. Um, most of writers get on with each other because we're all in the same boat. Yeah. Uh, we have to be kind. If we're not kind, what can we do? There was a writer, wasn't there, who faked reviews. Yes, he did. Yes. Oh, we know him. He was a nice bloke, but he faked reviews, <laughs> making good reviews for his books and crap reviews for other people's books. And I don't think that's quite right. Oh, nice. No, that's not. It's not. It's not good conduct, is it? I mean, we went to. We we did really good on book sales at the um, London Excel, the Comic Con in May, oh. and there were some well known authors who came in and did a talk and then they sat I think it was three maybe four of them in a in a row and everyone went up to sign mm -hmm. and this one lady Holly um she's a well-known young adult writer she she was like that massive queue and then everyone else sat like Billy no mates and we we all in the authors stalls who weren't even big enough to get on the panel and do a talk anyway just sat there going so that's who we want to be. <laughs> and yet so, we haven't even got close to being the one sitting next to her with no one in our queue yet. <laughs> don't, don't, don't be somebody else, be yourself. That's the most important thing to say. Yeah. I used to do a writing exercise with my creative writing students that they should do an internal commentary on what they were doing. That you all have to do banal things. I think you were talking about loading the washing machine earlier. Mm. We all have to do banal things. So to practice putting things into words, you describe what you're doing in your head. Next, of course, she looked at the washing line and the rain had just started to come down. What was she going to do? Was she going to rescue, find the dog and rescue it or was she going to get the washing? You keep this and it helps you learn to balance sentences in your head. Eventually, you think that taken away from the funny farm, of course, because you do it out loud. But seriously, when you start, you practice with words all the time. You get the right word, and it's that's the. If you can't have words, you can't have books. 
Okay. See, that's why you should get a pet, whether it's a hedgehog, a cat or a dog, because you can talk out loud and everyone just accepts it. You don't go off to the funny farm then. Allergic to dogs, I'm afraid. Allergic to cats. I, I have a very profound relationship with my teddy bear. I will say no more. <laughs> and um, how about yourself, Edward, with uh, any characters that you closely relate to? Well, as Julia said, you're bound to be, part of you is bound to be in every one of the characters, but specifically the, the protagonist. Um, and mine tend to be, I try and make them different each time, obviously, um, and make them genuine for the period in which, in which they appear. Um, and I wanted to write about uh, Elizabethan drama, and the obvious thing was to go for one of the stars of, of the period, one of the great actors, and I thought, well, no, actually, the person we want is the person who's just behind the sort of what we would call a stage manager, which what they would call a book holder. He was the man who technically held the book, the one single copy of the entire play, which had been written out for them. And he would prompt and he would, if he was sufficiently good at his job, he would also give advice in a way that uh, modern directors were. But he would not push himself he would be around and he would know everybody and he'd be the person who would be the uh, the agony uh, aunt for all of the younger members of the, the company i have to say this doesn't reflect my experience of input he would have been upstage in the front <laughs> wearing the best tights and the best boots that there are <laughs> <laughs> he was the most successful protagonist is a victorian detective who's a dandy and He's very athletic, and I see Edward every time he starts writing about this detective, mentally donning the silk top hat and straightening his cravat, and then starting. Where's the quill pens with him? Yes. Uh, we used to have a painting by a man called Frith, who was uh, one of the great uh, artists in the Victorian period, just called the Railway Station. And in the right hand corner, if you look at it, this wonderful swirling. Uh, mass of people, various, and each part of the thing has a thing. There's, there's a, a bridal party here. There's, there's a touching scene over there with children being sent off with somebody. Um, and then up there is somebody being arrested by two men who look beautifully dressed with top hat and uh, tails and so on. I thought, that's my man. Let's see what happens if we can and, run and with there, it. Every time he looked across the dining table, I thought Edward was looking at the dean. No, it was just over doing <laughs> his head. <laughs> no, inspired by something just behind you. <laughs> well, that's the story of my life, I'm afraid. <laughs> I can relate to that. Um, so another one that is quite big and something I'm learning about at the moment, because obviously the world has changed and probably in all your writing years, you've seen a massive change in how everything is done. Um, and it changes weekly with algorithms and things on social media and, and everything here. So what marketing advice would you give to new writers? And does your agent or publisher help you a lot with marketing or do you still have to do a lot yourself? How does that work for you? Well, it's the publisher who does the marketing for you. So individually, you shouldn't have to do anything. But Judith and I have a series of talks that we give to libraries usually. Uh, for obvious reasons. We spoke to Asylum Sister Library quite recently. Um, and we're going to be speak, speaking next week, I think, mm -hmm. to somewhere, somewhere else. Uh, and you always get questions back from them from would-be writers. And we always say the most important thing is to keep at it. Yeah. Don't worry about the rejection slips. Everybody's had those. Just keep going until you've got your own style and you can find an agent who can take you on. When I was a beginning writer, and they had this unique selling point about writing about Birmingham. Um, I had an enormous amount of publicity provided by my agent and by the publisher. I'd be on local radio every, once a month at least. I was on, local, I was on television. Um, they interviewed me about this and that and the other. Um, I had pieces written about me in the local, in national press. I've got a cartoon on my office wall about that appeared in The Guardian. You need something that makes you different from everyone else. I don't think that applies. I think the trouble is we're advising a different generation with an entirely different background. One thing that has helped me an enormous amount is a company called Joffa Books. 
and they've republished a lot of my old books. They're out of print or the rights have reverted to me. And so they are, they're reissuing them in new jackets, new titles, new titles, I didn't like that. But they're selling because they're online. But again, Joffa Books are doing this enormous publicity drive. I'm suddenly famous in New Zealand. There you are. <laughs> Somebody's got to be famous in New Zealand. Here's an example of a story which came from the fact that Judith and I go dancing. We've been taught by this wonderful lady and we go off for dance weekends in places like uh, uh, Devon, which we'll be going to this year. And I thought, well, what a wonderful idea. So I moved the whole thing back to the period just before the, the First World War. And uh, the story came perfectly. As it happens, our dance teacher's husband was a detective inspector of constabulary in Gloucester. She herself worked for the solicitor who dealt with uh, Fred West and the killings there. So she was actually in the Winston Green prison with him interviewing Fred West, this dreadful man, um, just three feet away from her. So you use everything. Um, I think there's a Shakespearean character called Autolycus, a yeah, snapper of unconsidered troubles. And that's what a writer has to be. We've lost your sound. We've lost you. It's because my cat was playing with a cardboard box, so I muted myself and forgot. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember when you did that book, In Cold Blood, at college, and oh, yeah. it really hit me hard, that one did. It was an oh. incredible um, story. And actually, Olivia's recently read it, and she just went, I was like, right. but ever since then, there's a part of me that really would like to interview crime murderers, serial killers. It's like, don't, don't indulge them. Don't no, indulge. no, that's why I've never gone down that route. But there was always a little part of me that thought it would be fascinating. I watch Piers Morgan doing it today. And it's not as satisfying as I thought it would, because it does seem to be like giving them that ego boost that they're after. But uh, yeah. Edward and I have both worked in prisons. Edward did drama for quite a long time because in those days they believed in rehabilitating criminals and educating them when i left college i decided i'd go and become a prison visitor not the sort that does individual prisons during visiting now because i thought morally that would be a bit iffy since i was a crime writer but i'd go and do the inspection to see the conditions and so on and I got properly trained, I got excused jury duty, I got all sorts of things. I went on my first day and I knew I couldn't do it. Because most of the, I would divide the criminals in the local jail as people who weren't functionally literate, people with huge drug issues, and people with huge mental issues who've never been in prison in the first place. And that's why I wouldn't want to get involved with criminals. Plus, as you said yourself, some people don't seem to have a moral compass mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah. And don't want to give people like Andrew Tate any more air room than he's got at the moment. No, absolutely. There is a lot of horrible people around. But like you two, an amazing amount of beautiful people too. So there's always balance, I believe, in the world. Um, yeah, marketing, I think it would just be so nice to be traditionally published to have that lifted yeah. off you as a writer. I think that is one thing that self-published writers struggle with. You know, you're an author, you want to hide in a cave, write your books, you don't want to be out there doing all this marketing, so people struggle with that. Um, how do you approach writing dialogue, and do you have any tips for crafting authentic conversations? First of all, it must be a conversation in the, in the book, because a conversation is the sort of thing you say to somebody sitting next to you on the bus. It's got to have a purpose and a drive all the way through. Um, they're not just talking, they're talking to push your book forward. So that's the first thing. You ask yourself subconsciously, what do we want to get as a result of this dialogue? Um, as for getting it authentic, listen to people, how do you think? Yes, absolutely. Would somebody, ah, I remember what I used to teach my students now, read it aloud. This is the huge advantage of being a small writer's group. Because you read everything aloud, you read the prose bits, the dialogue bits, and so on. And when you you don't have to have other people, you read it aloud while you're sitting on the loo if you want. Oh. And you think, well, you can. We're short of time. You think, 
that doesn't sound right. Would anybody actually use those words in real life? And if you are a self-critical person, you think, we would never use that sort of polysyllable. Yeah. That long thing. And you, but reading it aloud, big thing, read it aloud. It's interesting you said that. I've just done an interview with the a guy who does a lot of penguin audio books and we were talking about the same thing because even though some of my novels have gone through intense editing copy editing and you know I'm I'm a pretty good editor but it's hot you can't edit your own work Olivia is brilliant for her age especially she catches the copy editors out you know she's yeah. she's, she's gonna be an editor in the making and um she still finds errors when she does the audio books after all those you know she's so reading it aloud we've now decided we should do that before we even publish them from now on when olivia was very much younger we went to blenheim palace mm. and she said judith there's a funny thing about this no she said it's not funny and it's not just interesting and she groped around until she came at this nine-year-old it's intriguing. Mm. And that's what a writer should be. She's not going to be a great editor. She's going to be a great writer. I, I just mean the editing just comes really it. natural to her, yeah. She cares about the words. Yeah. That's what, that's, well, I, that's I ask her for help with my book reviews because she, she talks better than I do. And I'm just like, how do you come out with that? She's just so brilliant. But yeah, it's, in, it's incredible. Um. Edward, how about yourself? Any tips for crafting authentic conversations? Well, I spent 15 or 20 years writing drama, which meant I had professional actors reading things that I had. And you very quickly get to economise with words, mm -hmm. if you like. Make sure that you, know, you don't put any kind of uh, flowery stuff in there. Just make sure it sounds like real speech or real speech of the particular period you're, you're writing about. Um, uh, I mean, I used to do a lot of uh, stories based on uh, real uh, famous uh, authors. I did a story from Dostoevsky, which I had to transpose into what I thought was 19th century British language. Um, and it worked because the actors were so good and they, they adjusted little tiny things as we went along. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And how do you approach revisions and editing? And how has your manuscript evolved throughout the process, apart from the, that you do each other's? <laughs> well, it depends on how much time you have to, to do it, obviously. Um, and if you change editors, which is what's happened twice to me in the last uh, 15 years, you've got a difficult sort of bedding in period with the new person because they have a different attitude to to what should be there. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes you have an argument, you do have a problem with, with one editor who challenged her about the word, Judith had a line about the collect in church. Um, what was the reason? I had my vicar character. Um, I'm trying to find him, here we go. Thomas Campion, my vicar character, went into church on his own, as a vicar would, and read the morning service out loud, and read the collect for the day out loud, as you do in a church service. And this was deleted, he took the collection, and I said, wasn't nobody else in church? So how could he take the, oh, well, he wouldn't use these. I have had an editor who, yeah, yeah, we won't, we won't mention any names, but that sort of experience is not uncommon because you, I'm writing from my worldview, and she or he is going to write from his world. Well, the lady, in, the lady was actually South African, and she was not a churchgoer, so no. she didn't know what the collect was. She thought collect was a mistake for collection. Yeah, no, but that's you know we we just come back to what I was saying earlier. If somebody thinks they need to change something, it's probably that you do need to change something, mm. but not necessarily to what they say. Yeah. So, yeah. But the reading aloud, I think it helps everything. Yeah. I... And usually the editors come up with some wonderful ideas and you can sort of have a, a bit of luck. I wrote a book for an um, American publisher and I needed a character um, 
who was a Hopi Indian. Um, and my editor said, would you mind if I made a few changes? Because I was brought up on a Hopi Indian return. And I said, oh, please do anything you like. And suddenly this character jumped off the page because, you know, we had some wonderful insights in, into the behavior of the, uh, that particular tribe. Yeah, and I think that's an important point as well, because I've asked people to review and then been surprised that this person knew a lot more about horses than I did, gave me yeah. a complete, oh, you need to change that. That isn't, no, 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 it doesn't look like that. And I never even thought about those things. So getting yeah. feedback from other people and reading out loud, I think is good. No. Well, that brings us back to the other thing. Rachel, research. Yes. Writing horses, you've got to know every inch of the horse from the what goes in one end to what comes out the other end. Sorry. I did actually think I had researched it, but the world of horses is ginormous. Yeah. And you've got so many different breeds that it also yes. can be a bit subjective. But, you know, yeah. there's a lot of politics in there. <sighs> yeah, it's crazy. Oh. I mean, I've spent time with county cricketers and police officers at various levels, mm -hmm. scientists, um, one or two human beings too. Um, you know, really seriously, it's, it's a matter of digging deeper than you knew that you had to. And I've learned about, that. The yeah. thing about research is it's rather like an iceberg. Edward knows huge amounts of history, far more than I will ever know, because I don't know what he agree with him. But he uses a tenth of that knowledge, perhaps less than that, when he's writing the book, because he's got to know it to know what you leave out. Mm. So that's his background. And he does huge research. I, I'm not, I started writing about the Victorians, not my period. The Regency is my period, but I have to find out a lot about the Victorians. Yeah. And I did. I did. Yeah, I write about Victorian males because my father was an engine driver and he was away at war when I was born. I didn't meet him till I was six years old, but coincidentally, I met him on a railway station when he came back on a troop uh, train. And we were in a tiny little, my brother and I, this huge crowd all around us, and suddenly the train comes in. My mother says, there he is. And we pushed our way through, and we saw him for the first time. Um, so, and other members of the family were involved with, with railways, and the railway line was just down there from the road from where we lived. Um, so I find writing about them and the whole thing. Judith and I spent our wedding anniversary One year. going down to drive a train, a steam train, mm -hmm. uh, in the Yeah. You get down there very early and you have a very early breakfast. And then you take it in turns, first of all, to be the, uh, the, guard. the guard, then the driver, fireman. and the fireman. So you, you've the three important people on the train. And it was only, it's only a mile and a half or so, but you're in charge of the train as it's going up and down. And then you have the fun of turning the train around. We're talking about the locomotive, the locomotive with enormous power. Uh, and wait on a turntable. Four of you can do it. Takes a little while to get it going. Once it's going slowly around, you can. It's a wonderful example of Victorian engineering. Wow. My my moment wasn't that because heaving things round is what a woman does all the time. Um, my moment was when you have this tons of steel, and I tried to put the coal in and not have very big tons of putting coal in things. But opening the regulator and this steel, this huge animal made of steel, and hoof, hoof, and making me do, and do it, making it, it's just one of the moments that I shall cherish till I die, because it was just, but you see, this is what writers should do. You expose, why should I go and drive a train? Well, yeah. but you do it because it's there. And Who knows what will happen after that? Who knows? All I know is that at the age of quite a lot, I'm umpiring a cricket match on Saturday because I've got my research in cricket. <laughs> oh, that sounds like fun. You'll have to let me know how that goes. Um, what projects are you currently working on and do you have time to do a sneaky read or preview of any of them? Do you want to? Well, I don't want to read aloud for a mile at the moment. No, really. 
don't that's fine because I will read I will read something for people in a separate post thank you we have done lots of talks separately and together and one of the worst things is when a writer chooses a bit to read aloud and they read it as if they are reading a railway timetable and it's really 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 because you have to put you have to do it with drama and you have to do preparation we both read lessons in church on last sunday and the rector came up afterwards and said you read that really well and i said well we practice it mm. we wouldn't just pick up a book and read it because that's what we want to give it life mm -hmm. and that includes the point giving the bible like no. fair enough um, this is one of my favourite questions I've been burning to ask you, and I know we're coming to the end. Are you all right for a couple of more questions? Yeah. Super, thank you. What one thing would you change about the publishing industry? I'd get rid of celebrity writers in quotation marks. Yes. Yeah, here. <laughs> I mean, I actually got invited. We've both been invited to ghost books before. And I find it very, I find it peculiar because nobody would say, you're going to go play, you're going to drive a little car around Silverstone or wherever it is, and you're going to claim to be a racing driver. But actually, you know, what are you? You're a TV presenter. Why should a TV presenter think it's okay to publish a novel that's been written by somebody else? I just find it bizarre that somebody should want to do that. Why should somebody want to pass on, pass on something that isn't their work. Okay, they might have said, oh, well, I know a lot about dogs, or we write a novel about dogs, but it isn't them that's doing the sweat, the crying at night, lying awake wondering how you're going to make that chapter end. No, I'm sorry, I would ban a lot of them. How about that? Yeah. No, I totally time. love yeah. that attitude. The beauty of the novel is that you have complete creative control. That you don't have if you write a play. The moment it gets in the hands of the actors or a particular director who takes a strange view of it, then it's at your, you know you have no control over it. So what would you do about with with the novel? Make sure you write for yourself and put your personality in there. And if it's historical, then you've got to do your homework beforehand. Otherwise, you're going to have people from all over the world um, writing in and pointing out things that. Uh, Glaringly obvious. So, Edward, is there anything specific you would wish to change in the publishing industry if you had a magic wand and could do anything? Um, no, you, you can't have perfection in, in the, the modern world. You're going to have all sorts of people who will just set up their own companies and start publishing. Um, so, you just have to adapt to what the, the existing structure. I would like to come back to the readership thing that I started with. Readers need writers, writers need readers. Instead of closing libraries, expand them, get everybody reading. It'll, if you spend money on young people, give them a place to go, to be safe, to reduce knife, knife crime almost automatically drawn in lives and libraries. Um, we met one librarian who actually ran an ASBO club. And on the Saturday morning, the kids who had ASBOs would come to the library and play board games and read and do all sorts of stuff. It became so popular that she would be approached and said, please, miss, I haven't got an ASBO, but can I come anyway? <laughs> I, I just think we need to use books. And the publishers would have to be involved in this because some of the prices that book publishers charge are very high. Mm. I censored that before it came out. Mm. They're very high indeed. I don't want a glittering cover. I just want a cover that holds it together so that people can read it. So please, please concentrate on the reader and the reader's experience. Get rid of crap celebrity levels and concentrate on the Joe Bloggses, the Edward Marsons, the Judith Cutters, Rachel Lewins in this world. I agree. The celebrities are stopping non-celebrities from getting a look in. Um, and, and I know we did a panel at the Science Fiction Convention Centre, and we were talking about this and how so few books actually make a profit. Yeah. And that's why they go for the celebrity ones, because they have millions of followers, so it's an immediate profit. 
But what I do notice, and I work with AI in IT as a project manager, is that when people create ghost written books or AI created books, they don't do well because there's no heart and soul of the writer behind it. And that's my personal view, if you like, but it's also what I'm seeing from what other people are saying and doing. So I'm, I'm completely with you there. Um, so just to close then, if you could offer one final piece of advice to aspiring writers, what would it be if you haven't already said it? Find your own voice. Don't copy anybody else. Find your own voice, your own individual voice, which people respond to and want to hear time and time again. Okay. Nothing more to say. That's it. <laughs> well, thank you so work. very much. Work and work and work. It's hard work being a writer. Do it. Yes, it's a lot harder than I thought it would be. So thank you very much for your time today. And um, yeah, Edward Marston, Judith Cutler, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.